Hey everybody, good afternoon. I'm Carl Schusler, the moderator for the panel today to discuss alternative payment models. However, before I introduce the panel members, I've been asked to mention a few informative housekeeping notes. One, since this is a part of the Flacco's virtual conference, this session has been pre-recorded and is being played back at the time slot on the conference agenda. Secondly, even though the session has been pre-recorded, the panel members are currently available to respond in real time using the chat box feature on your screen. Also, thirdly, please know that there will be no dedicated Q&A at the end of this session. Instead, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box during this discussion and we will respond accordingly. Finally, the recorded session is limited to 45 minutes, so we will get as many questions in as we can during that time. There will be no Q&A after, you have to do it in the chat box. Finally, the Commission of, on Flacco's panels has asked me to conduct this in a strict fashion, and each panelist will only have a limited time to answer the questions. And if anybody gets a little too loquacious, then they're going to be asked to nip it in the bud, and then they will be buzzed and potentially muted. Um, also, before I go, I wanted to say there's a big football game this weekend for all you Floridians. I'm a Georgia Bulldog, and it's been 1,468 days since those stinking tank top jort wearing gators that beat my Bulldogs. So hopefully they'll continue to streak this weekend. Now I want to open it up and introduce the panel. And I'll start with, with Tim Kohler, Bluestone Physician Services. Tim, you're on the clock. You have 30 seconds. Hi, this is Tim Kohler uh, from Bluestone. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Bluestone. We're a, a primary care clinic that provides services, medical services to people living in residential care settings. We have about 17,000 patients in uh, about seven markets in three states in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Florida. Okay, great. All right, Dr. Dickerson, you're up. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Kristen Dickerson. I'm a practicing radiologist in Houston, Texas, and I own a company called Green Imaging that offers a national network of affordable, high-quality medical imaging centers um, for self-funded employers, uh, cost containment companies, and even individuals nationally. Chris Yarn, walk-on clinic. You're up. Hello, how you guys doing? My name is Chris Yarn. I'm the CEO of Walk On Clinic. Uh, we run a company that brings on-site primary care to employer groups uh, by putting these mobile clinics that you see right here behind me uh, on wheels to all these self-funded employer groups, uh, providing the same patient experience you would expect in a brick and mortar facility, but more convenient access to care for the employees. That's it. All right. I didn't get buzz. Kelly Jackson of Payer Compass. Good afternoon. Thanks for having us. Uh, my name is Kelly Jackson. I'm Vice President of Sales and Client Engagement for Payer Compass, based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, we are a healthcare technology company in the cost containment space. Uh, do a lot of reference-based pricing, but also work with self-funded employers and the various um, other organizations helping self-funded, really bringing transparency of what the cost of care is. So. Looking forward to talking more about that in this session. All right. Thank you, Kelly. Barry Murphy, Fair Call Self Plan. We're delighted to be here. My name is Barry Murphy. I am a, a street benefit advisor. I've been doing it about 48 years. And I partnered with Carl about eight years ago in a specific new direction that we reference as actively managing a health plan. And that includes bringing together many of the resources on the panel here with us today, as well as others, to take a more active role in managing healthcare costs and eliminate the middlemen. All right. Thank you, Barry. All right, Tim, we'll go to you first question. What is appealing about the current ACO models, Tim? And I'll give you 60 seconds this time. Tim? Um, ACO. Can you hear me? We did not. You want to start back over? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. We have uh, one thing I didn't mention in our intro is we have a large ACO, uh, 6,000 patients in our three markets. And what is exciting for us about the ACO is really taking on higher levels of risk. Um, and that will allow us to change our models of care. So right now we only get 
paid if we send a physician or one of our advanced practice providers in to provide a service. But what our patients need, these high-risk populations often is um, they need social workers and they need care coordinators and they need um, navigation across the healthcare system. And changing the models of care by taking on more risk and having more of the healthcare dollar to work with um, will allow us to change those models. And we find that uh, pretty exciting. Okay, thank you, Tim. All right, Dr. Dickerson, why do you feel direct contracting for imaging is the easiest first step in changing from a traditional health plan to a more actively managed plan? It's a great first step. It doesn't require much change. It's not somebody moving the employee's cheese. It is actually, um, they see it as a benefit, especially if it's not rolled out at re-enrollment. If it's rolled out um, mid-year as a true benefit to them with a low copay or zero out of pocket. It's a great way to save about 60% on um, the image, medical imaging spend in a health plan. Okay, wow. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Dixon. Chris Yarn, are your alternative payment models only available regionally or nationally? And what is the scalability of how many practices within an ACO you can serve? So you have two part question. Yeah, so um, we started as a Florida-based company serving here in Florida, working with a lot of independent physicians, giving them scale. So they want to extend into another area. They have, you know, a much larger scalability. When COVID testing here happened recently, uh, you know, we figured out ways to take a little small primary care practice and help them see 500 patients in a day. So obviously, it's a good alternative payment method for them. Um, our availability to scale into different markets is completely different than the traditional brick and mortar model. Um, we're, you know, we're at about 120th the cost to put a, a clinic on site that can see 100 patients in a day. Uh, and we can be in pretty much any market in the U.S. within 30 days. Um, if an ACO had a need for, you know, 10 or 20 mobile units to be deployed or something like that of a larger ACO, um, then you're probably looking at more like 30 to 60, 60 to 90 days to deploy something at that scale. All right. Thank you, Chris. Man, you just beat it too. You basically beat the buzzer. Um, well, I'm just, my goal is to just not get completely shut down by the, uh, by the buzzer. That's, that's my, my one mission today. All right. Well, we just don't want you talking over everybody or starting to go break into a Frank Sinatra tune and with your other AKA Frank Mike dropper personality. Um, Barry uh, Murphy, we're discussing alternative payment models. Fair cost is a health plan. Why should a, a broker advisor health plan be part of this discussion today? Well, I think that uh, you've brought together several very good resources on this panel. And of course, there are others that are not part of this program as a result of space and time requirements but someone has to put this all together and coordinate it and integrate it through a common database in order to optimize the impact on uh, each individual resources contribution to the greater whole. So we're, we operate as somewhat as the central nervous system. We also perform a marketing function uh, to bring these resources to the self-funded market. All right, thank you. Uh, Kelly Jackson. The slow talking Kelly Jackson from Dallas. Um, Kelly, uh, talk to us a little about, about reference based pricing as an alternative payment model that has become a frequently mentioned option for employers and to be able to continue to provide health plan benefits for their plan members. And what are the advantages of a reference based pricing plan? Sure. So, reference based pricing is, you know, in its core is trying to bring down the cost of healthcare, primarily in big hospital claims. Uh, it can be used in various ways. I mean, there's some employers who will, will forgo all networks and just do reference-based pricing. You know, that's a big leap. But reference-based pricing can be part of many other arrangements. Um, it can be a wrap through a lot of direct contracting. It can live alongside uh, networks as an added network solution. So. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a tool, it's another tool. You gotta have a lot of tools in the shed to, to bring down the cost of care and yet provide quality care um, to, to your members. So, uh, you know, it can help uh, bring transparency into your direct contracts. You know, getting a direct contract, having um, uh, 
you know, as, as Dr. Dickerson said, you know, just carving out a piece of it and, and having, um, you know, imaging uh, direct contracted and then maybe using reference-based pricing for your facility claims or your out-of-network claims. So uh, it's, it's an option to bring down cost um, at the same time, paying providers a fair and equitable rate. All right, great. Hey, you didn't happen to have any of that uh, any of that stuff you guys sent me over because you're talking a little slower today. Trying to do uh, my best to slow it down for my uh, Georgia friends. All right, thank you, Kelly. All right, Kelly, I follow up question: How receptive are providers, say some of these ACOs or whatever, or plan members to reference based pricing? Uh, it depends on the market. Some markets, uh, reference based pricing is certainly more, uh, you know accepted than other markets. Uh, a lot of it's education, explaining, you know, what the reimbursement is, having a conversation with, with, with providers and payers as to, as to what reference-based pricing means, um, you know, having it as, as a piece of, of the whole solution that, as Barry mentioned, you know, somebody's got to bring all the solutions together. So uh, it's, not, it's not the only one. It can, it can be wrapped and packaged with DPC, walk-on clinics, direct contracting with, with providers. Um, and, and once I think you get in front of people and explain what it is and, um, you know, processes of, of how you're going to work with members, work with payers um, and, and the plan to, you know, the goal is to lower cost of care for, for the plan and for the members. So um, it, it's, it's accepted in, in different ways. Certainly some markets are more accepting than others. N newer, it is certainly a newer, um, you know, idea. And so, you know, we do a lot of it in, in some areas and there's some areas of the country that it is really t relatively new and, um, you know, more education needs to be done. Well, it's fun. Kelly, you say that, uh, it's funny, my, 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 uh, Mr. Murphy over here, he's always said most of the hospitals don't have a problem being reimbursed tied to Metro Medicare. It's just what level that metric is, is their problem because it is accepted all over America at all the hospitals. All right, Chris. When working with an independent primary care practice, what alternative billings have you brought them that they have liked the most? Yeah, I mean, outside of, you know, the traditional player stuff where those are good contracts for, you know, an independent practice to get, um, you know, COVID has been a, a big biller uh, for, for these physicians um, that need a way to test outside of their office space. Um, and do large scalability, like I mentioned before. I think the, the biggest thing that we do for these medical practices is they make money every time we work with them. So where you might you know, pay an internet marketing guy to get you a couple thousand patients a month or something like that, we literally move the clinic three times or four times a month and get you to that thousand patients. So it's really just about um, being intelligent about how you're gonna deploy the convenient access to care to where the patients are. Um, and then celebrating all those same continuation of care practices that the, the primary care office already has in place. Uh, and I, I would mention one other thing since it's an ACO uh, conference, it's also a way to population health manage and increase your uh, hitting your metrics. So if you've got an area in your ACO or practice that's not performing well, you can make the convenient access more convenient for that group of people and then use it to deploy your, you know, annual wellness exams for Medicare, just depends on the scope of the practice. Okay, thanks, Chris. Just follow up for you real quick. How do you see the post COVID era affecting those opportunities in the future? So I think the two big winners coming out of COVID are, you know, telemedicine as a technology. Um, and then I think mobile healthcare as well. And I think most people are paying attention to telemedicine, but you just saw Advent Health System switched everything to Zoom. So you have all these big tech giants, you know, Zoom, Facebook, Google, you know, WhatsApp, Messenger, all of these platforms now that are now overnight HIPAA compliant and that are being used as a telemedicine platform. So what's that, what that's done is it's given connectivity to all these practices in a digital format in a way where consumer utilization is finally up. Um, but there's still thousands of billable services that cannot be done in a telemedicine type fashion. So what I think it does is I think in the post-COVID era, you've, you've got a great opportunity as a practice to extend your scope of services and the reach of your brick and mortar facility and then continue those billable services through telemedicine offline. You can, you can go touch a patient population 20 miles away from your clinic 
you know, in a walk-on clinic for a day and then capture all that patient data in your EHR system and then continue to, to go through. And I'm sure there's some remote patient monitoring companies that are at this conference as well that can integrate into that process. So it's about kind of being able to still do the physical inhuman stuff and, as well as, you know, the connectivity of telemedicine now. So. All right. Well, I don't think we'll call on you anymore. You buzzed me there on that. You went way over your time there. Um, uh, well, we well might I'm come... waiting for the guy to pop up and buzz me off stage. We might, we might come back to you, maybe. We'll decide. All right. Dr. Dickerson, how is direct contracting, how might that arrangement be structured? Um, direct contracting uh, can happen a lot of different ways. If there is a traditional TPA in place for a self funded healthcare plan, the green imaging is bolted on, like vision or dental. And, you know, we have. Plan, we had suggested plan wording for that. If it's an independent TPA, it can be written into the plan. But once again, we like it not at re-enrollment. So the best way is a plan amendment because we want the employees full attention to this and we want them to see it as a benefit, not just some other way that they're being, um, you know, sent somewhere that they don't want to go. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Tim Kohler. We asked you a minute ago what you thought was appealing about the current ACO models. What would you like to see change? What could improve them? Um, I think, you know, specifically for us is, you know, we're, we're really focused on high-risk patient management. And so we've got a, a very atypical population from a normal ACO that may have a general uh, swath of members across the, you know, large Medicare population. Um, so the challenge for us is we've got this really high um, you know, very, very, very acute population. And our benchmark set, though, is, is uh, modified to, um, you know, modified down to because they assume that we're more like a normal ACO. So it's a challenge for us because our costs are, you know, twice, two to three times what a normal Medicare patient is. Um, and so we're, there's lots of opportunity within that population to manage costs and ED visits. But when we're being compared to a normal Medicare population, it's really difficult to, to get the outcomes that we're looking for. Um, so I'd like to see more um, focus within the ACOs on some of these discrete populations and, um, and kind of some changes to how the benchmarks are set and those kinds of things to, uh, to better accommodate these really high risk, high cost populations. Um, I think the current methodology has some flaws. So that's, that's an area where we're trying to engage with CMS and, and CMMI on, on uh, future ACO models. All right, thank you. Mr. Murphy, what other functions does fair cost perform? Well, as I mentioned, we've created a platform. So we, we provide overall guidance and oversight. We start with the administrative partner, a TPA that is capable of uh, working with the individual resources that we bring to the party. Uh, and then we arrange for the risk component and my friend Tim pointed out the risk element in an ACO. And if you are an ACO that is gonna assume some risk, the more uh, control and cost containment, the better. We wrap all this together with what we call a weaponized plan design. In the city of Jacksonville, you can spend anywhere from $36,000 to $115,000 for a knee surgery. And yet the typical health plan the cost to the employee is the same wherever they go. We believe in, in, in uh, trying to drive down out-of-pocket costs for employees by providing a higher level of guidance and, and steerage, if you will, to our directly contracted partners or where quality and cost are indicative. So you might have no out-of-pocket if you go to one hospital, but you're normal and regular out-of-pocket if you go somewhere else. So we just wrap everything together and we're also, because this is an alternate and different delivery system, we're responsible for educating employees and how uh, to best utilize the benefits that the employers put in place. Okay, thanks, Barry. Um, Kelly, a thought for you. What, what, what partnerships do you feel are, are neat or, or, or factors should you consider uh, when weighing the options to switch to a reference-based pricing plan? 
question. Uh, like Barry said, you, you need partners. And so typically it starts with, with uh, a broker consultant. You need somebody who understands that, that there are alternatives out there. And, uh, you know, these alternatives are going to save the plan and, and the member uh, money. Uh, so certainly broker consultants typically is where a lot of these uh, you know, or arrangements get pulled together. Uh, need a third party administrator who can think outside the box and, you know, not just plugging in your old standard old, you know, renewal uh, and look at, at connecting with, with other uh, organizations. Um, you need, uh, you know, maybe it's DPC or walk on clinics, things like that. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, getting direct contracts with, with very specific targeted providers. Um, and then certainly, you know, we would think you, you, you could use the benefit of uh, uh, an excellent reference-based pricing vendor, whether you're paying reference-based pricing rate or you just need help with, um, you know, the technology piece of really understanding the cost of care and, and having tools to help members, you know, navigate uh, high quality, lower cost um, options. Okay, thank you. Tim, what payer trends do you see emerging in your market? Um, you know, specifically because we deal with these high cost populations, we're seeing a lot of payers get into the, um, the ISNIP space, the institutional special needs plans, and starting to focus on um, these more discrete populations and the, the, um, the extreme cost of some of these populations. And, um, you know, you used to only be a few ISNIP plans uh, in the marketplace at all. And, you know, as United had a plan, but it was mostly focused on um, SNF and as um, as the I think value-based pricing and as um, some of the uniqueness of these populations has started to spread throughout the marketplace, we see more and more plans um, entering um, and taking advantage of those um, those mechanisms to manage higher cost and higher risk populations. Hey Tim, I, I one one of the question you know for a middle Georgia boy who just fell out of a deer stand, when you say SNF. I start sniffing. Uh, you may, I assume you mean skilled nursing facility? No, I, well, in that, in that, I was actually saying SNP in that case, which is a special needs plan, which is a, you know, focused on, you know, population that may have a diagnosis or, um, or you know, uh, have a situation where, like, they live in an institutional setting, like a skilled nursing facility or um, assisted living, memory care in our case. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate clarifying that for a, a sure. more slow-witted, balding man. Thank you. Um, yeah. All right. Chris, why should an ACO with a large footprint of brick-and-mortar facility partners need a mobile solution? Aren't, I mean, aren't mobile health care um. solutions more for rural health care? Yeah, I mean, I, I would challenge that thought process of, you know, why would a, why would retail stores 20 years ago in distribution channels? Why would Target or Walmart or Kmart with these massive retail footprints need uh, distribution stations, right? And then they got slaughtered by the guy, they're paying $7 a square foot retail, and they got slaughtered by the guy that's doing 30 cent uh, per square foot distribution centers. So I think we're, we are in a different world now than we were before. And the more convenient access you can provide, the better you're going to, I mean, you can even just look at the success of the minute clinics inside of the CVSs. It's, they literally took a retail footprint with closer geographic areas to all these residential properties and the patient populations exploded. So I, I think it's just, You've got to do whatever you can to stay competitive in this quick market to just provide more convenient access to care anywhere and everywhere you can do it. So that would be my my thought process on that. Okay. Thank did you. I go over again? No, you didn't. You didn't do too bad that time. You. you did okay. I'll, I'll give you. We'll let you stay in the game a little bit longer, even though there's a bit of a delay there. You must. You must be. You must I be. Think down. You got to start kicking people. It just kick them off the call yeah. when they go over. They, I got they cut feeling. off completely. I got a feeling you're down at Red Flag Farm and the reception's not good in spots down there. All right. Um, Dr. Dickerson, it, it gets challenging to get employees and, and members of health plans to make different decisions. So how do you steer employees out of the traditional plan 
onto a bolt-on solution like yours? Got to be great plan design, um, number one. Zero out of pocket for imaging or small copay. Um, I had a, a independent TPA that put in a $375 copay. That's not a copay because most of our exams don't cost $375. It's a maximum out of pocket. So the plan design has to be right. Um, if the mammography is included, if breast imaging is included and you know, 40, 30, 40% of the employee base is having a mammogram every year, that gets people using us in a low stress situation and they're more likely to use us in a high stress situation. Pay, employee education is just huge though. A lot of people don't realize they don't have to go down the hall at their doctor's office. They can go across the street and not be subject to their copay and deductible. Yeah, one, one follow up there, because I love that when you say it, it's, it's more like something I would say, talk the <laughs> down the hall mentality. Like when my father practiced, you know, he was doing his job. If uh, they had a sonogram machine in their office, as you know, he's OBGYN. But if something else was needed, he'd say, hey, you know, Betty, just you need to go down the hall, you know, to the hospital. Talk about that real quick. Okay, 70% of doctors in this country are employed by or subsidized by hospital systems. The cost of care all the way through the episode of care is around my best estimate. I've seen it published in the 250, 2.5 times range, but I really, from the claims data, I see it's the three times range. So three times more expensive all the way through the episode of care. And, um, and we find that, you know, pretty much to hold up that way in our, in our claims data, once we um, show our savings, we're saving at least pre-COVID 70%, COVID 60% on the medical imaging spend. Hmm. That that's, uh, seems quite cartelish, those numbers you share. Oh, yes, sir. Um, uh, Murph, what are some of the examples of specific ways fair cost impacts FLACO members? Well, I think Dr. Dickerson hit the nail on the head. It really does come down to a dynamic plan design as opposed to the static plan designs that we're used to from our friends, the major carriers. But we have, uh, we're big fans of ACOs. We have a very distinct community uh, feel. We wanna make sure healthcare dollars are left in the local community as opposed to sent to Wall Street. So a lot of our work is to eliminate the noise from middlemen that uh, physicians and ACOs see when they're dealing with the bigger insurance companies. Um, we try to eliminate barriers to care so that I, I think we have a, a dramatic impact on uh, proper protocols and compliance. And very importantly, through a weaponized plan design, not only can we control and eliminate the hassle of pre-authorization and pre-certification, but we can get our providers out of the collections business. Once again, making insurance a meaningful and real benefit to the employee, as opposed to leaving them in a situation where the out-of-pocket is so high, they may as well not have any insurance because they can't afford the out-of-pocket. We even have uh, uh, procedures where we can pay for, uh, uh, for things in advance on a cash basis, uh, making cash flow king for the ACO. Okay. You, uh, um, Tim, I'm, 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 I, man, I really don't wanna ask this question. Uh, as a actual COVID survivor myself, um, boy, I'm hesitant. I'm just about worn out on the discussions, but uh, what is the biggest long-term impact to your ACO or that you see as a provider group due to COVID? Um, probably definitely the biggest thing that we've seen has been mentioned here a couple of times and that's telemedicine. So we, um, we were already providing telehealth services through for our psych programs. Um, but pretty much within about two or three weeks, we converted our entire visit population for all of our patients to telehealth. And so about 80% of our visits um, went to telehealth um, all through the COVID period. Now we've moved back into assisted livings and memory care buildings. Again, seeing patients in person, we're probably 70, 30 now uh, in person. But during those early months, it was uh, pretty much all telehealth. And I think the, the long lasting impact of that is now that the payers are all con you know, continuing to pay for payer health, including Medicare, uh, telehealth, including Medicare, is that uh, where we saw, you know, people going into the ER on a weekend or something, if we weren't in a facility, now they're calling us and we can do a telehealth uh, visit on the weekend. And 
Uh, we think it's going to have a significant impact on, on necessary utilization for the ER and for uh, inpatient hospital stays, which often our ED visits get converted into. Um, so we're pretty excited about, about telehealth. And there was some reluctance in the early on uh, months of the buildings because they were so locked down. The assisted livings and memory care units were so locked down because of COVID and having these vulnerable populations. But they pretty quickly realized that if they didn't have, if they weren't getting some care and getting scripts refilled and getting uh, the patients maintained, that they were having worse, pro you know, worse healthcare problems than COVID. And so um, uh, it was pretty, pretty interesting to watch the industry morph and adopt um, to telehealth. Uh, over the course of the COVID months. Okay, thank you, Tim. Kelly Jackson, um, how do, it's interesting. I, I've all, I mean, we, we all want to make sure we are paying a fair price for something, fair cost, no pun intended. How does an employer understand they're getting a good deal from an ACO? You need to benchmark um, you know, what the cost of care is. And certainly Medicare, um, because there's really no other good benchmark, Medicare is what we use. So Medicare um, costs, uh, you know, Medicare payments are derived from the cost of, of what the care is. So it's, you know, there's, it's based uh, locality, you know, if it costs more to deliver care in, in Los Angeles than it does in Birmingham, uh, then the, those adjustments are made. Uh, across the uh, you know facilities uh, outpatients all based on wage index inpatient a lot of things to consider in the cost of care you know here in Dallas if you go have a hip replacement down at Parkland uh, you know it's trauma four it's it's uh, teaching doctors runs the ER 24 7 different cost for that facility to provide that care versus the hospital down the street here in the suburb so I think uh, you know using Medicare as a basis uh, is a good start and, and when you're looking at your direct contracts and whether you're doing reference-based pricing or direct contracting or whatever, understanding what the cost of that care is and uh, using Medicare as a basis um, is what we have today in this country. And so you can benchmark, you know, what you're paying for certain services to what Medicare would pay. And then, you know, of course, uh, you got to add something to it because um, it's going to be hard to get, to get commercial payers to accept, uh, you know, just 100% Medicare. So you do have to increase it to a reasonable, um, you know, amount above, uh, you know, just base Medicare. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chris, uh, you've often said uh, a phrase that we, we, we love and we use often, you, you always say uh, to an employer, how many of your employees, Mr. Or Miss Employer, would vote for single payer right now? And you often always compare them to some of these other high performing health plan models that we're discussing today, where most of those employees would probably say, we love what we have. We don't want single payer. Talk about yeah, how, it's, go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, uh, I think it's, it's such a good question. And I think there's so much data out there already around this. Like, when you talk to an employer that has an on-site clinic or has solutions, you know, baked into the plan, like some of the ones you're seeing today, or maybe even has a great partnership with a local ACO and primary care is addressed up front, and there's not a lot of balanced billing going out. If you change the subconscious interaction of healthcare access every time that person interacts with the healthcare system locally, right? Every time they're using their insurance card or paying cash or paying a reference-based price or paying a negotiated image rate, their experience in healthcare becomes a good one versus a negative one. Uh, employer groups that have not done anything innovative for their employees when it comes to health insurance plan design or trying to find these solutions, the, the entire market is, those, those are people that rightfully so think the grass is greener on the other side. And I, you know, I don't blame them for saying, hey, let's single payer systems got to be better than this balanced bill and these outrageous, you know, rates that I'm paying every two seconds. It's, we've caused it ourselves, you know, with a lack of transparency and a lack of innovation when it comes to healthcare. So um, I think the more convenient access we can provide, the more innovative we can be as an industry, the better off we all are to continue private healthcare in the United States. If not, there's going to be one payer eventually, and that's going to be the federal government. Y'all think I should mute him? 
I mean, he, he, he's a pretty loquacious fellow. He makes me look like I, 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 I'm short-winded. Um, anyway. I, oh, I have to say one other thing since you just said you were going to mute me. My, my only other thought on this is if you go to a single-payer system tomorrow, you know who the largest employer of physicians is in the United States? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's Optum. It's United Healthcare. So make no mistake, folks, all of you ACOs out there watching this panel and watch this call, they want your market share. They're employing all of the doctors you went to medical school with in much larger numbers. They are well, they're extremely well positioned for a single payer system. They will be the largest biller of that single payer system if it ever stops. So you've got to put your feet down as an ACO and as an innovator, and you've got to come to the market with better solutions, or you're going to give them their, your market share when it is a single payer system, because they'll have more bandwidth than you, yeah. and they'll, they're going to move quicker. So that's all. Thank you, Mr. Yarn. Um, Barry Murphy, what impact does fair cost have on actual insurance costs? Because we know about, and I'm sure you'll discuss, Fixed costs being admin fees, you know, stop loss premiums, variable cost or claims, which is where you can really make hay. What does it do to the fixed cost in the reinsurance area? Well, I want to uh, bridge off of what Chris just said. Uh, I was remiss in not mentioning a very real part of uh, the fair cost uh, effort is to allow ACO. Imagine an ACO being able to talk directly to the end user without having to go through an insurance company that is looking to over-regulate and uh, bump up the price. We, uh, we construct plans that meet the needs of the providers and recognize those needs and communicate those needs effectively. Most members of an ACO want to deliver care, but as it relates to the insurance costs, yes, our fixed costs are higher, because we brought more resources, but the return on that investment is enormous. When you talk to a reinsurance company about having uh, uh, diabetic management, remote, uh, monitored, and uh, protocols, making sure prescriptions are being taken properly, eliminating the barriers to care so that people are compliant. That's just one example. Uh, and Carl, as you know, one of our clients in Florida experienced a reduction in their healthcare reinsurance costs for the second time in that reinsurance company's history. And um, in that particular instance, we, we took the medical spend down from 2.2 million to about a million four. And uh, the reinsurance uh, world is coming to recognize the quality and the impact of active management through fair cost and uh, are, are, are expressing their excitement and interest in the reinsurance factors uh, that we're getting for our clients and prospects. One quick follow-up to that, uh, Barry. One of the things that we hear a lot from physicians, and, and, and again, hearing my father, he spent as much time on the phone with insurance companies as he did taking care of patients, dealing with pre-certs and prior arts and peer, peer reviews. Can you comment about that? Is there what you can do with your, your program? Well, again, we, we at least allow the physician community and in, in particular the ASO to have input on designing what is appropriate for pre-authorization and pre-certification. Um, we don't want, again, barriers between physicians and their, and their patients. We want to facilitate that. We want to make the uh, out-of-pocket expenses for the employees lower so that they can more work closely uh, with their physicians in, in designing and implementing their care. All right, thank you. Dr. Dickerson, is direct contracting for imaging, is that available nationally, regionally, and what is the scalability with, with you know, how many practices within an ACO could you actually serve? Our company is national. Um, we're not in a few states uh, yet because we no longer build out the network unless we have a large number of lives to leverage great pricing. Um, but if we have a patient in an area that we don't have a facility, we're the experts in shopping for medical imaging. And so we go out and shop for that patient and get 
usually the same kind of deal we can with a direct contract uh, with a facility. Um, but you know, you can you if if you're a small group or you know ACO, you can certainly contract with a regional provider. Um, but what we bring to the table is uh, being the radiologists and reading the studies to assure quality. Or if we're not reading the study, we have peer review privileges. So it's a kind of quality that uh, you can't put any metrics on that. Um, you know, we're all MD Anderson trained um, subspecialty radiologists. And, you know, that's just a big difference between us and a bureaucracy. Okay. All right, thank you. We're, uh, we, I'm gonna throw this out to everybody, guys, and then we're gonna, this is the lightning round, so you gotta be lightning quick to get it done. So here, here's, here it is, and I'll start. I'll go Tim, Dr. Dickerson, Chris, Kelly, and Barry. Y'all hope y'all can remember that. I'll test your, test your uh, mental skills. Who on the panel today thinks they can directly help ACOs from a population health management standpoint? And how, if at all, can you directly improve the patient panel data that leads to higher percentage reimbursements for the ACOs and their doctor partners? Tim, quick. We can't, we can't hear you, Tim. You're muted. You're muted. There. <laughs> Um, we, we focus on uh, these high-risk patient populations, and they're populations that it's really difficult for most ACOs to get to. Um, we're out in the field. We're mobile clinics. We have uh, nurse practitioners and physicians and care coordinators and stuff that are out in the community, um, and we're really servicing populations that aren't served well by the traditional healthcare system. So in, in that context, I think um, we have a, have a unique value proposition for those patient populations. Doc Dickerson. You're muted. You're muted. Um, we do it by um, constant education of the employees um, as to the need, especially if you're high risk of getting getting that mammogram, getting those screening exams. And we actually, you know, make it easy and affordable for them to get those studies. There's so many barriers to whether it's not, you know, not being uh, English as the first language. Whatever those barriers are, we try to remove those and get them to, this, to the medical imaging exams that they need. We also identify high-risk patients and it's, or a patient with a new cancer diagnosis, new stroke, and we get that back to the medical management company so that they can help get that employee to the best, highest quality, most affordable site for that. Okay, thank Gus. Uh, as usual, the first two to speak take a lot of the time up sometimes, especially when they're muted. So we got to be fast. Uh, uh, Chris, you're next. Answer convenient access. Quickly. Conven yep, convenient access to care. Kim just hit on it. It's working for their ACO, mobile clinics, deployment, hitting rural areas. Um, I think if you really look at integrating, you know, you've got a medical person that trains someone on using Zoom like we're on today or Microsoft Teams or WhatsApp. You can literally plug in the remote patient monitoring devices on site at these populations. Tell them they can call this ACO directly using WhatsApp or whatever telemedicine platform they're on after that and have a high amount of success increasing all of your, uh, your patient panel reimbursement rates as well. Kelly Jackson, we have about 40 seconds left. You've got 20 seconds and Murph gets the other 20. Fire away. Hi. We would be providing transparency of cost to our other partners that are on this panel so that they can help with the population health. Short and sweet. Again, uh, our objective is to uh, create access for the ACO with the direct consumer. Uh, it's not like Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. You have a wonderful ACO. Uh, we actually have uh, medical professionals, the CFO of a hospital that will go on a initial call with us to the customer. It is refreshing. They've never seen it before. They want to talk to you. We can help facilitate that. Well done. All right. So let me wrap it here. Anything else anybody want to share? Nothing? All right. Let me get this back. All right. So yes, we'll answer questions that they've done in the chat now. All right. So um, again, thank there you. And is. nobody really went way over too much. Uh, I do want to 
say one thing before I finish and, and thank everyone. Look closely at that hat, please. <laughs> Go dogs. All right. So thanks to Flacco's, Nicole and Sam with a great team. And thanks to uh, Payer Compass, Bluestone, Walk on Plant Agreements and Fair Cost. Thank you guys all for being a part of this session. Thank you, Carl. All right. Thanks for having us, Carl. All right. Have a good day. It.